the pioneering tracks that sparked off a revolution. This was the world's first intercity railway. This was about doing things like never before. One man was determined to change the course of history. Stevenson was a robust character. He was the man they needed to get the job done. Construction of tracks across an impossible landscape. Nobody thought you could build a railway on marshland. Why would you? How could Stevenson overcome the countless obstacles in his way? This was really some of the first large-scale engineering work that had been done since Roman times. And a tragic death on the tracks whilst the world watches. Shock, horror. Suddenly, the railways were proven in so many people's eyes to be the evil thing. This is the hidden history of the modern railway line from Liverpool to Manchester. In this series, we explore some of the greatest railways in the world and the secrets surrounding them. From the ancient hills of Europe to the wastes of the Yukon Valley in North America, their dark and forgotten pasts have left their mark on history. The Liverpool to Manchester Railway is nothing less than the world's first intercity railway. It's something we take for granted today, but this was the first one. It was here that the testing ground, the proving ground of so many ideas was made. It was the template for so much else, and we exported it across the entire world and changed the world forever. Thanks to the Liverpool and Manchester line, time became unified. And without that happening, the modern world simply couldn't exist the way it does today. Could argue that the whole world really is a branch line of the Liverpool and Manchester Railway, the first mainline railway in the world between two of the finest cities in the world. Although this 31-mile line may not look like much, it started a global revolution. But from the very start, there were massive problems. At this point in time, railway travel is like space travel today. It's, nowhere in the world has a railway system. So the Liverpool to Manchester idea, this is, this is crazy. The railway was as revolutionary a piece of transportation as we see the self-driving car today. Are we going to crash? Are we going to have accidents? And people felt as nervous about the railways. They thought that if you went over 30 miles an hour, that you would suffocate. Before the railway was developed, all the naysayers were saying, oh, it'll destroy the countryside, it'll poison the birds, it will never work. You had the fact that people had all these myths and fears. Women could miscarry, birds would fall dead from the sky, cows would stop milking, and because tr trains would replace horses, the horse would become extinct. There were very split opinions about the viability of railways. People really weren't sure that they were safe for people to use. But the future of modern railway hinges on one event that would decide the course of history. For locomotives, it was almost their last chance. They had to prove that their way was the best way. This is where the railways as we know them were born. This is the place for the modern railway as we understand it. This is, in fact, Rain Hill, where the Rain Hill trials were held in the October of 1829. The Rain Hill trials were designed to see which machines had what it takes to run on the world's first intercity railway. I so wish I could have been at the Rain Hill trials, and I think probably every engineer on the planet does as well. The future of locomotion of the railways was actually in the balance. Imagine you're a person in the 1820s. The fastest thing you've ever seen on land is probably a horse galloping along. 
10,000 to 12,000 spectators gathered from across the world. To come and see these great mechanical beasts, these iron horses, effectively battle it out to become the fastest things on Earth. But powerful forces were working against the idea of public railways from the start. At the beginning of the 19th century, two cities maintained Britain's heavyweight status on the global stage, Liverpool and Manchester. Of course, Britain was at the very heart of the Industrial Revolution. The Industrial Revolution had been pioneered in Britain. Little Britain had the huge navy and controlled most of the world's international trade. So we were really at the cutting edge of the whole industrialization of the modern world. The port of Liverpool, once made rich from trading slaves, now stayed rich by importing slave-picked cotton from America. So you've got all kinds of goods coming through Liverpool, but particularly lots of raw cotton. And it needed to come to Manchester to be processed. So the northwest of England had really taken off as a textile center for the globe. But there was a fundamental problem with the system. Often it would take as long to get goods, the 34 odd miles between these two cities, as it would to get them across the Atlantic. But what made the journey so slow between these two northern cities? Railway historian Anthony Dawson knows the details. This is the Castlefield area of Manchester, and this is the 18th century commercial heart of the city. This is where the Duke of Bridgewater's Canal came into Manchester. This was the M62 of its day, carrying bulk freight from Liverpool to Manchester and back again. The canal companies had a monopoly on this trade. They could charge what they wanted, and the service was appalling. It was very slow. If you were carrying something like milk or butter, it would have gone rancid by the time it got to the destination. They had to build something faster and better than the canal. But what this could be was far from clear. In the 1820s, the only railways were short lines used to carry raw materials, some pulled by horses, others by engines that were perceived as dirty and polluting. The railways were seen as terrifying machines, these fire-breathing devils. Of course, before this, all locomotion had really been horses pulling canal boats, people traveling on horses. These are natural organic things. Steam engines were not natural. But northern engineer George Stevenson had seen what they could do and is prepared to fight for these ill-famed machines. But did he have what it takes to change the course of history? He wasn't an educated man. He was self-taught. He'd been around engineering, he'd been around machinery, and he just instinctively understood how these things worked. In order to build a railway, Parliament had to pass a bill to approve it. So Stevenson worked with surveyors on a potential route for the line. The surveyors set out to try and work out the best route between Liverpool and Manchester. If they get the right route, the railway's going to happen. If they get the wrong route, it could cost thousands and thousands of pounds more, and the enterprise could ultimately fail. Stevenson was called to Parliament to justify his route, but it didn't go to plan. You have people in Parliament as well who look down on people like Stevenson with his Northumbrian accent and his northern ways. They thought this wasn't the way to be a scientist, this wasn't the way to be an engineer. He must be a fraud. In fact, Stevenson had been working away on a coal railway elsewhere, and his team's survey of the route contained errors. Parliament ripped it to shreds. And George, under cross-examination, fell to pieces. His survey was pulled apart. It was discovered that his bridge at Eccles would have been underwater. Imagine that. You know, one of the greatest minds of the age was laughed out of the place. 
It was deeply embarrassing for George, it was deeply embarrassing for the company. But why was it so hard for Stevenson's team to put together an accurate survey? One of the reasons why Stevenson's survey was so bad was because they hadn't had permission to actually carry out their survey. And when they had to go through people's private properties, they had dogs set on them, they had guns fired over them, and even local tenants armed with clubs and sticks to chase the surveyors off the line. They, the aristocracy did everything they could to stop George from building his railway. Landowners didn't want a railway invading their private land. And the fact is, the Liverpool to Manchester Railway faced powerful opposition in Parliament. There were those landowners and those parliamentarians who despised the idea of the lower working classes becoming mobile. They was thought they could cause riots. And more importantly, you actually had the canal owners who have feared a railway coming in and taking away all of their money. Against all this opposition, George Stevenson had a very strong vision. He wasn't perturbed by it, and he pushed forward certain that railway was the future. In the end, Parliament rejected the bill. Would Stevenson be able to make his railway a reality? this turning point in history as we now know it. You know, what could have happened? Would we have had a greater ship canal? Would we have had it widened earlier? Would we have had more steam power on canals? Would ship power have been developed as an alternative much faster? Who knows? It really was a turning point. To have a chance of getting the bill through Parliament, an alternative route had to be found for the Liverpool to Manchester Railway, one that could be approved by the landowners. Historian Michael Bailey explains. George Stevenson had posed a route uh, that was slightly north of the route that we are now following along uh, between the two cities, uh, because uh, it was determined by the characteristics, the geology of Liverpool Liverpool docks, obviously, at sea level, but just in from that sea level, you've got a barrier. The higher ground outside Liverpool was bypassed by Stevenson's original route, which travelled north from the docks before turning east to Manchester. But the route was changed to avoid landowners' property, and the bill was finally passed into law in 1826. However, this new route crossed some impossible geography. Everyone knows the ideal way for a railway is from A to B in a straight line on a flat surface. But Liverpool to Manchester didn't have that luxury. The first challenge was that this new route now had to stop at Edge Hill, 123 feet above sea level. When they got to Liverpool, they were at high ground, not the level of the docks. That was the major problem that they had to resolve. But how could Stevenson overcome this seemingly impossible task? Paul O'Donnell from the Liverpool to Manchester Railway Trust knows just how he faced the challenge. Where we're heading, is a place so secret, very few people know of its existence. I say, because for me, this is one of the most important places in world history. In order to decrease the gradient, Stevenson decided to dig a more gradual route down through the sandstone rock to the docks. We're in the Wapping Tunnel. Just one of these dark, secretive places that because it's been sort of left here and forgotten for so many years. Myths do arise. They had to tunnel nearly one and a half miles through sandstone beneath the city streets down to the dock at Wapping. It was a massive undertaking. Everything was done by hand with pickaxes, shovels and blasting powder. The work was done by labourers known as navvies who lived in camps along the line. They worked long hours, 
and in really intolerable conditions. And health and safety, you can forget about it. People died on this job. Heavy workers and heavy drinkers and heavy fighters, but they could really shift the stonework. Uh, so they could move like a, a couple of cubic tons a day. Stories that they bleed from their eyes with the amount of work they were doing is not unheard of. Excavating underground, the navvies could see only by candlelight. And the work was fraught with dangers. Had a 30-foot cave-in, and there was a big botanical gardens above it at the time. It was dangerous and very dark work. To construct this mammoth tunnel, whilst workers excavated from each end, eight shafts were also dug down from above, all aiming to connect up. And when they all met up, they met up perfectly. There's no computers, there's no GPS, and it was perfect within an inch on each section. The quality of the engineering is inspiring. Although too steep for locomotives, Stationary steam engines could now take goods up and down to the docks using an endless rope system. At 1.2 miles, it was the longest railway tunnel in the world at the time, and a huge engineering achievement in itself. But the path ahead was still far from smooth. Just west of Manchester, as a train passes, is an inexplicable sight. Why is the track wobbling? Much of the Northwest in the 1800s was made up of wet mosslands, a marshy terrain dating back around 10,000 years. One section, Chat Moss, lies directly on the route between the two cities and posed a huge challenge to the construction of a railway line. A huge expanse of bog just to the west of Manchester, in parts at least 30 foot deep, and it was said where man and horse feared to tread for fear of drowning in the quicksand. It's just this boggy, nasty marshland that spreads on for far too long. How could Stevenson ever dream of running a multi-ton locomotive over the top of a sinking bog? At Risley Moss, Ranger Mark Cousins is an expert on this landscape. So this location here, uh, you can see, possibly, we can walk across this. Wouldn't cause us too many difficulties to build on. It still looks as if, oh, it's stuck too bad, a bit spongy, still okay to go. And then all of a sudden, you hit an area and you'll start to sink deeper and deeper and deeper. Peat bogs are unstable, marshy landscapes, covered with a layer of vegetation. It's formed sphagnum mosses, cotton grasses. Sphagnum moss in itself can hold vast amounts of water, as I can display with this here. You can see there, it doesn't look much. Like a giant sponge, constantly growing and growing, taking in carbon, fantastic carbon sink. But underneath, to try and build on it, not so good. Once broken, this spongy layer gives way to a peaty quagmire of dead plant material. You couldn't walk on it because you'd, you'd sink up to your armpits in it sort of thing, and, and it was most unpleasant. Now, how do you build a railway across a moss? That was the major problem that they had to resolve. Stevenson initially tried to stabilize the boggy area with harder material. Piling in loads and loads of ballast and stone and sand. But there were some bits which was so boggy, it was almost impossible to cross. The pressure was really on poor old George. The work to cross Chat Moss had taken far longer than anticipated. In fact, the board of directors were getting increasingly anxious about the work. George had to find a solution, and fast. He turned to the locals for advice. And so what they said is you have to float it across Shatmos. And the way to float it is in fact to take uh, trees and to lay them into a kind of grid 
which formed a kind of matting. He made a sort of springy mattress out of branches and brushwood and used that to then support all of the infill. You literally floated the iron railway across the marsh. Stevenson had found an effective way to drain and cross Chat Moss, but people were still skeptical that this marsh railway was safe. In order to prove his critics wrong, on New Year's Day, 1830, George Stevenson took the train of carriages with passengers in across Chat Moss and proved triumphantly that a railway could be built over that bog. And the same track is still floating today. If you were to go to the side of the track and stand there as a train comes past, you can feel that gentle bow wave as the force of the train passes you. You just feel it rising and falling. An absolutely ingenious method. Even today, when we try and work on peat bogs with diggers, they sink quite easily. Way back when, thinking how to get this railway across here, creating those rafts, absolutely amazing. Against the odds and the naysayers, Stevenson had found a way to conquer nature. But there was another nasty surprise waiting along the route. He'd tunnelled under Liverpool, he'd bridged Chat Moss, now he had the Sankey Valley. The altered route had to cross the 68 feet deep Sankey Valley and the Sankey Canal. How could they build a railway over this great expanse? So to get the train from one level across the valley at the same level, they had to find a solution. And the solution they had was a massive viaduct. Now, this is the, the Sankey Viaduct, which was built to carry the Liverpool and Manchester Railway in 1830 over the Sankey Canal. You might think, these arches are rather high, but in fact, there used to be barges with sails travelling along here, so the, it had to be built of a sufficient height to accommodate those. And it was a tremendous engineering achievement. The Sankey Viaduct was one of the most expensive structures on the whole line, and with nine arches, was the biggest of its kind ever seen at the time. The architecture of this railway was designed to impress. It was a way of the railway company expressing its power, its wealth, as well as its substance. They were saying, we are here, and we are here to stay. George Stevenson had achieved the impossible. Today, if you build a railway, you have a whole team of experts behind you, and you have a century of information. But for Stevenson, this was the first in the world. There are no other experts to turn to. And actually, he had to be a politician, an engineer, and a manager. It's a lot to ask of someone to combine all of those specialist roles. But he did it, and he forced the railway through. But there was a pressing issue threatening to kill Stevenson's dream for good. It may seem incredible, but with construction well underway, no one even knew what would run on these tracks. Looking back at it now, it's obvious, right, you choose steam locomotives to haul trains along a railway, but that wasn't the accepted idea of the time. Existing locomotives were seen as unreliable, and an unknown quantity. They were clanky, they were noisy, they were dirty, and they kept breaking down. It's what everybody feared about them. Obvious solution at the time was to use stationary engines. They were proven technology, they were simple. Stationary steam engines hauled carriages along by a single continuously moving rope. But this limited their speed and efficiency. But the director had cautiously voted in favour of the tried and tested technology. George Stevens was absolutely furious with this decision, and he feared that the Liverpool and Manchester Railway would be strangled by ropes. One of these stationary engines failed. 
you've lost the whole line. If the locomotive fails, you lose one train. Steve has said that locomotives are worthy of a fight and they will not be cowardly given them. To settle the matter once and for all, the directors came up with an unusual solution. Let's have a trial to see if the railway engine can be improved and is it as good or is it better than a stationary engine? The trial was held on a flat stretch of track at Rain Hill, nine miles from Liverpool. Entrants had to prove the engines could carry a load of 20 tonnes at the speed of 10 miles per hour for the equivalent of the distance between the two cities. Open to amateur and engineer alike, the directors received all sorts of crackpot ideas. Multifarious schemes were proposed. Locomotives where the friction was reduced to nothing, where they could pull trains with a silken thread, using perpetual motion, using columns of hydrogen and water or mercury. Some of these schemes are absolutely ludicrous. One of them wasn't really an engine. It was a horse on a treadmill connected to the wheels. But the chap who made that was actually on the board of the company. Stevenson was determined to prove the power of the locomotive. But with George busy on the line's construction, it was his son Robert and company treasurer Henry Booth who produced an engine for the trials, named Rocket. But it had stiff competition. Three other steam locomotives had made it to the actual trials. Perseverance, Sans Pareil, and Novelty. The favorite with the crowd as it resembled a familiar fire engine. The Rainhill trials were a pivotal moment in modern history, really. But disaster struck before the race could even begin. Perseverance, when it was carried up, it got dropped and severely damaged. So that basically left three engines for the trials. There's a real war of attrition. Over the course of the trials, three judges were watching from the sidelines to see which engine had what it takes. First of all, Novelty's doing its run. First time out, the bellows burst. Then the water pump went wrong. Finally, she disappeared with a loud bang and a cloud of smoke. A joint had come undone and she was done, finished, a complete write-off. Then Hans Pry is going, it had problems. It's two cylinder pistons, one of them cracked which meant that steam went through the cylinder, straight up the chimney, drawing all the fire with it. So it was throwing out sparks and cinders as she moved. When it was Rocket's turn to perform, it reached just over 24 miles per hour, exceeding all expectations. Rocket had won the Randall trials, absolutely beaten the competitors. Stevenson must have been absolutely ecstatic and as at the end of a grand national race, the spectators must have been cheering and applauding as Rocket steamed triumphantly past them on a final run back towards the bridge, knowing that Rocket had entered the history books. Reaching a heady 35 miles per hour on a celebratory run, Rocket proved once and for all that steam locomotion was the way forward for the modern railway. It was a real turning point in the railways and the fact that the locomotive could be seen as reliable and it could do the job. Stevenson was vindicated and came away in triumph. But how did Rocket beat competition from all over the country? What was the secret to its success? The National Railway Museum has two replicas of Rocket. Curator Bob Gwynn knows what gave this little yellow engine the edge. We start off with a water-jacketed firebox here. It's burning coke in there, and all the way around it is water, and that's getting boiled up to heat. And then we come to here, and there's a multi-tubular boiler. Now, this was the heart of it. This was a real fabulous secret for this machine because most of the other machines in the competition at Rainhill, they didn't have this. 
While most of its competitors had just one flu, taking hot gases from the fire through to boil the water, Rocket's multi-tube boiler has 25, giving it much more steam. Engineer Simon Holroyd is doing an overhaul on one of the replicas. Locomotives that didn't have this arrangement had to stop. They'd get so far, they'd run out of steam, they'd have to stop while the fire heated this water up again, so they had steam, and then they could continue. Whereas Rocket, because of this, this fabulous connection, would just keep going. The other secret of this is, instead of sending the steam up to the cylinders and once it's done its work to drive the wheels, just exhausting it on the ground, frightening the horses and people, no, you, with this, you can send the steam up the chimney. And this is called the blast pipe. And what it helps is it helps draw the fire. It's a bit like putting a newspaper over a domestic hearth. It helps draw the fire and make it even stronger in heat terms within the boiler, which gives you even more steam. So it's a completely virtuous circle. Designed to defy the negative stereotypes, Rocket consumed its own smoke, was more reliable and more powerful than any engine in history. So it was a world beater, and actually it lays the template for all steam locomotives worldwide. The grand opening day of the much-awaited Liverpool to Manchester Railway approached, and everything had to go perfectly to show the world the brilliance of this British engineering triumph. But no one could have anticipated the tragic accident about to happen. Opening day, 15th of September, 1830, we've got the Prime Minister, who is also the hero of Waterloo, the Duke of Wellington, the ambassador from Russia, the ambassador from Austria. We've got the consul from America, several MPs, they're all here. And expectations were incredibly high. Unfortunately, on the day, things didn't quite go as planned. Improvements to the engine's design were being made at a terrific pace, and Stevenson himself was aboard a new Northumbrian engine, but Rocket was still there for the occasion. There's hundreds of thousands of people today. They are on every bridge. If they can see the line, there are people 3D watching it. A cannon goes out, and they were off. The trains were hurtling along the track, but they had to stop to take on more water along the way. Travelling at around 22 miles per hour, there should have been no danger, but passengers weren't used to machines moving at this pace. They had been given instructions for their safety. They were told before they all started, don't get out. As soon as the train stops, they all get out. The train stopped on the south track for water, and MP William Huskisson took the opportunity to walk up to the Prime Minister's carriage to greet him. Then, next minute, Rocket is coming up the track on the North Rail, and everyone notices it. There's lots of people milling about, and the cry goes out, train coming. Now, there's no brakes on the engine. There's brakes on the carriages for what they're worth, but the only way to stop Rocket is to put it into reverse. Huskisson panicked as Rocket hurtled down the track towards him. But, of course, he also had no concept of speed or what these machines were. People say, get out of the way, get out of the way, or get in, get in, and he dithers a bit. And he twice crossed the line and then recrossed it. He stopped, he panicked, he turned round, he came back again, and basically anything wrong he could have done, he did wrong. Rocket was bearing down on him, and in some desperation, he grabbed hold of the door of the Duke's carriage, and it swung open, leaving him hanging. And he falls across the track, and actually, the engine runs across his leg. And he then, sadly, died that very evening. The tragic and poignant aspect to Huskisson's story is that he'd been the MP who championed the railways, and yet, on the glorious day when they launched, he was the one who died on the railway that day. At the railway's crucial hour, the world watched in horror as Rocket took an MP's life in a gruesome death on its tracks. News of the first public railway casualty spread far and wide. 
shock, horror, Huskerson was dead. You know, the, 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 suddenly, the railways were proven in so many people's eyes to be the evil thing. Huskinson's death was front page news, and there's really no such thing as bad publicity. It made the railway famous in a horribly ghoulish kind of way. But once the service started, an unexpected turn of events took place. Initially, the railway was designed for freight, but suddenly people started to realise you could take people. And the demand for that went through the roof. There's a demand by people to say, well, look, if a, if a piece of goods can go along it, why can't I go along it and visit my auntie in Manchester? And indeed, why not? And the railway realised very early on this railway was going to make its money not from freight, but from people. Tucked away in the heart of Manchester, one place is particularly important to the history of the Liverpool to Manchester Railway. Erin Beeston is a researcher at Manchester's Museum of Science and Industry. This is Liverpool Road Station. It's the oldest railway station in the world. It was the Manchester terminus of Liverpool and Manchester Railway. Trains of goods would arrive into this multi-storey warehouse, where gravity hoists could move them up and down the building before being loaded onto carts to be moved around Manchester. On the opposite side of the tracks was the passenger station. So this is the first class ticket office for Liverpool Road Station. There was about four times as many passengers than they expected in the first three months. About a thousand passengers a day travelled through the station. Cheaper, faster and safer than stagecoaches, it was a whole new experience for the first passengers. So these are the kind of carriages that people would have been on. If you're first class, well padded, comfortable, glazed and so on, if you're in the second class, well, I'm sorry, you might be able to sit down if you're lucky, but fundamentally, you're going to get very wet and very cold. Many disgruntled passengers refer to these blue boxes or rattlers as being travelling pneumonia wagons. Travelling at such speed behind a locomotive meant that you'd get all kinds of smells, you'd get the steam, you'd get dirt, you were exposed to the elements. You could be in this carriage and hot coals would come drifting down in the smoke. If you weren't careful, it might set your hair on fire. It was an interesting experience to travel in Liverpool and Manchester, but it was an exciting experience for the first passengers. What was once thought impossible had now become a reality. The famous phrase of this period was an annihilation of space and time. What they were saying was that actually the railway shrank space. It meant that places were much closer together. The stories of a man who was seen trading in Manchester at one o'clock, went to Liverpool, did business, came back and he was at church in the evening. So all these stories of, my God, the speed of this. It starts an actual social revolution as well, because you're able to travel, you're able to meet different people. You know, the, the gene pool changes. It's, it's a major revolution. The Liverpool to Manchester Railway transformed the way we live. It allowed people to travel in a way they never had done before. It improved people's diets. It created connections that were never there before. But for me, the most extraordinary thing is it changed our concept of time. But how did a railway that opened in 1830 affect our timekeeping today? Time is a function of geography and longitude. So before standard time was invented, everywhere had its own time, and that was perfectly logical. But the idea of trying to run a railway with departure and arrival times when every destination was on its own time was utter chaos. So it was very complicated. And certainly Henry Booth, who was the company secretary and treasurer of the Liverpool and Manchester Railway, made a, a plea in the 1840s to try and introduce some sort of standard time. Although Booth was unsuccessful, Parliament eventually came back to his idea. In 1880, GMT was officially rolled out across the country, and Britain 
was brought under one time zone. GMT being adopted later on meant that suddenly time became important. One legacy of the Liverpool to Manchester line is being kept alive by a group of volunteers in Manchester's Museum of Science and Industry. Although rocket started the speed revolution, improvements quickly led to the planet-class locomotive, bigger, faster, and stronger than anything before. Ian Hartman is one of the firemen working on this replica. So, obviously, this is Planet. Um, Planet is one of the sisters of Rocket. Um, it was the, you know, the, the pinnacle of steam, you know, brand new, out, fresh out of the box, and um, everybody wanted to have a go with this, really. Completed in 1992, this replica still runs today. It's got character. It's raw. This is built with, you know, wooden struts, steel, and it's, it's a lot more bare-boned, if you like. They built this up uh, as a replica in memory of the first railway, uh, so people could visit uh, and see that steam is alive. And this was where it all began. It all goes back to the pioneering Liverpool to Manchester Railway. Between them, the Stevensons had created the fastest machine on earth and the longest railway line over impossible terrain. I think really one of the true heroes of this story is George Stevenson. He was the man that created this railway. He's the man that kind of provided the impetus for locomotion. He's the man, really, we can say, with all honesty, is the father of railways. Despite all the myths, fears, and challenges, the railway was a huge success. And soon, Britain was leading the way across the world. The British were the pioneers of the railway. Uh, you know, we had the technology, the know-how, the ingenuity, the raw genius that you need. We were the world leader. The legacy of the Liverpool and Manchester Railway is truly global. Within 25 years of it opening, there were railways on every continent on Earth, apart from at the two poles. It's the short 31-mile railway that changed the course of history. It's the fact that it shaped the country, it shaped the world, you know, it went from this first 30 miles of line. By the start of the 20th century, they had 30,000 miles of line. And it just, it's, it's just inspiring. This started here. It's affected almost every aspect of our life. It's not just this country. When it was developed, people recognised the importance of it. They said it was actually more important than the, the invention of printing. It was more important than the discovery of America. And that's this, this spot. Railways transformed the world in the same way as the jet engine would transform the world after the Second World War suddenly people were brought closer together. And when you bring people closer together, you get a greater sense of nationhood. It is an incredible achievement. And the whole of the rest of the world is effectively a branch line, just a series of railways leading off that Manchester to Liverpool line. 